Hello everyone, tonight on Business Live, COVID-19 business recovery. Trade Ministry begins disbursement of 282 million cities to revive businesses and the industrial sector. Revitalization Enterprises support, the Ministry of Finance has graciously allocated 282 million Ghana cities to the Ministry of Trade and Industry to pursue interventions for the revival of an active trade and trade and so coming up, State of the Economy, International Ratings Agency, uh, Moody's keeps Ghana's credit score at B3 and economic outlook status at negative. And a discovery worth of billions, Iron Ridge Resources Limited eyes lithium here in Ghana, which could be worth $1.5 billion. This is where we collect the surface data and information about the geology. And this prospecting permit allows us to do all this work, but no mining. We have completed a scoping study, and that's all. It's a scoping study. It's My name is Daryl Carl. Thanks for joining us. Details right after the break. And thanks for staying with us. First up tonight, the Ministry of Trade and Industry has begun disbursing 282 million uh, cities to revive businesses in the industrial sector affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. According to uh, Deputy Minister of Trade, uh, Herbert Krapper, this is part of efforts to ensure the implementation of some targeted reforms to continue to increase foreign direct investments here in Ghana. He was speaking at the maiden SPAC-UP summit expected to unlock Ghana's investment potential. Deputy Minister for Trade and Industry, Herbert Krapa, disclosed that the ministry is expanding 282 million cities to businesses to help them recover from the impact of COVID-19. Speaking at the maiden edition of Spark Up Summit, he indicated that his outfit will fast-track the execution of some reforms. To emerge strongly from the havoc of the pandemic and restore the impressive trajectory of foreign direct investment, the ministry has accelerated efforts to build industrial parks and special economic zones across the country. The Ministry of Trade and Industry has also established business resource centers across the country to provide relevant business venture information and technical resources to private sector investors. We have also established joint business councils with some African and European countries to provide ministerial level support for driving investment between Ghana and partner countries. Under the Ghana COVID-19 Alleviation and Revitalization Enterprises support, the Ministry of Finance has graciously allocated 282 million Ghana cities to the Ministry of Trade and Industry to pursue interventions for the revival of an active trade and industry sector. Light manufacturing, agro-processing, import substitution, automotive, export and pharmaceuticals will be the focus areas of this intervention. Chief Executive of the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, Yofi Grant, is calling for partnerships to monetize assets to benefit from the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Africa is very well endowed, but unfortunately we export our raw materials and then import the finished goods out of our raw materials we export. And I believe that the AFCFTA gives us a great impetus to change that whole dynamic. And once again, I would like to say that the inspiration from the President of a Ghana beyond aid resonates loudly on the African continent. For us to actually monetize the assets that we have through partnerships and linkages and create a better continent of wealth creation and jobs. Meanwhile, Charles Idubwahin assured that his outfit will implement policies that will make firms competitive to attract more foreign direct investments. 
Essentially, to support FDI growth consistently and effectively, we realize that we must provide the proper framework of policies, institutions, and support services that make our firms competitive, provides incentives to invest in skills transfer, and provides an opportunity for investors to realize risk-adjusted returns in Ghana, which are far above the sub-Saharan African average. Given the fragility of the economy, both here and across the world, the essential requirement today is to do everything possible to nurture and secure a robust recovery where our economies emerge stronger from the pandemic. SPACUP is an initiative by the Ghana Investment Promotion Center and the Ministry of Information to connect investors, facilitators, private service providers, and the general public to unlock fully Ghana's investment potential. Now, international ratings agency Moody's has kept the country's credit score at B3. It has also left the economic outlook status at negative. This is after the agency carried out its assessment on Ghana's ability to pay back our debts and future threats to our finances. George Raffi has the latest. It was the expectation of some economists that with the pickup in growth, that should have impacted on Ghana's outlook review. However, the rating agency argues that because of the country's rising debt, which they don't see the situation improving anytime soon, it decided to leave the negative outlook unchanged. Keeping this as more of a warning that they don't see things improving anytime soon. On the B3 credit rating, which is more of one level just below junk status, Moody's maintained that it is also not convinced about measures being taken by government to improve its financial position to meet its debt obligations going forward. According to Moody's, it is particularly worried that it doesn't see the situation improving post-pandemic because of the high gross borrowing requirement and ongoing liquidity challenges. The development could mean that Ghana's cost of borrowing on the international market may not be coming down anytime soon if investors want to rely on the concerns raised by Moody's in its assessment. Private businesses would also not be left out as this development could also impact negatively on their cost of borrowing if they should turn outside for some credit support. According to the 2021 budget, government is setting aside some 35 billion Ghana cities as interest payments on loans. Now, mining giant Iron Ridge Resources Limited has hinted it is likely to secure permit to begin mining of lithium at the Awea portfolio near Sorpon uh, by close of year. The company says it is its, its prospecting rather has found significant quantities of lithium deposits in the area. Exploration manager at Iron Ridge, Iwan Williams, says after the scope study, revenue totaling 1.5 billion has been estimated with 14.5 million tons of lithium. Uh, deposits. Now, Richie Kodinyako has more in the following report. Preliminary Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organization test work confirms a Woya concentrate near Saw Pond produces high-purity battery-grade lithium hydroxide monohydrate. The Australian company has been prospecting for lithium for some months and they've announced significant quantities of lithium deposits has been found. Exploration Manager at Oil Ridge Resources Limited, Ian Williams, explains the company has been prospecting for lithium at the OER concession for months. He explains the level of activity ongoing at a concession. This is where we collect the surface data and information about the geology. And this prospecting permit allows us to do all this work, but no mining. We have completed a scoping study, and that's all. It's a scoping study. It's not even a feasibility study, where we look at our footprint when, when we announced a mineral resource of 14.5 million tonnes um, in 2019, end of 2019. And the scoping study is a, an indication of what could be there. It is not a valid financial statement or an economic statement. It's just an indication. And that scoping study um, has a, a total revenue of $1.5 billion. But that's total revenue. That's not profits. That doesn't take into account expenditures, doesn't take into account um, any of the um, fees, um, taxes, and processing costs and things that have to be taken into account. 
Ian Williams tells Joy News the company will soon approach government to go through the processes to secure a mining permit to begin the mining of the mineral. The prospecting will continue indefinitely or for, for, for the continuation of this license period, which is another three years, because we have found this particular deposit, but we are still continuing to add to it by moving our prospecting outwards. So we expect prospecting to continue. So we intend to approach the government of Ghana uh, hopefully this year, um, but it, it is subject to a successful feasibility study. The company says it's employed a huge number of the residents in its operations. Principal geologist of the company Abdul Razak also speaks about the uses of the lithium. The people we have employed or engaged on this prospect lances are all coming from the Fansman Municip municipality. And I think um, in terms of employment, um, we are doing better with the communities. Um, currently we've engaged about 220 people working here and we have about um, 50 professionals working at the moment. Um, some are consultants, some are contractors, some are permanent workers we are working with. Lithium is being used for um, batteries, like mobile phone batteries, laptop batteries. Currently the world is phasing out from using the combustion vehicles like petrol or diesel. And the world currently wants to go into electric vehicles. So I think the lithium is going to add up to the energy space. Municipal Chief Executive from Fantsman Kenneth Isuman dismisses claims that government has sold 150 billion of lithium deposit at Sopon. He says the prospecting of the company has not even ended for anybody to put value on the purported mineral. The misinformation in the media space that the government of Ghana has sold our deposit, lithium deposit worth 150 billion US dollars to iron rich resources of Australia is false. Nobody has even quantified or valued the deposit of lithium in the areas they are talking about. The iron rich resources is still prospecting. The company Oil Ridge Resources Limited tells us that they are hopeful that something good and significant would emerge from the prospecting they are doing here. From the saw pond rig my name is Richard Kwejo for Joy News. And you're watching Business Live with me, Daryl Kwa. Still to come, Managing Director of Carbon Clay People Development, Nick Sin Amwaiwa, speaks to me about team building and the positive effect it can have on business recovery. Co communication is everything. Actually, the, the concept of team uh, is built on trust. To, to have a team, you must have a trust. Hello there, welcome to another edition of The Money Lab. Today we will look at debt capital and equity capital. What is capital? Capital could be seed money for starting a business. And narrowing down, a business can acquire capital by borrowing. And this is debt capital. It can be obtained through private or government sources. For established companies, this most often means borrowing from banks and other financial institutions or issuing bonds. For small starting companies, sources of capital may include funds from friends, family, online lenders, credit card companies and some loan programs. Let's look at equity. With equity, we could have private and public equity. Private and public equity will usually be structured in the form of shares or stock of a company. The only distinction here is that public equity is raised by listing the company's shares on a stock exchange, while private equity is raised among a closed group of investors. When an individual investor buys shares of a stock, he or she is providing equity to the company. There are listed companies on the Ghana Stock Exchange across several industries, of which Republic Bank Ghana is one.
And welcome back to Business Live. The decision by the Ghana Cocoa Board to syndicate a higher amount of money for the next cocoa season has received recommendation from being traders, um, Olam Ghana. The company believes that their move is an indication that the sector is expanding despite the adverse impact of COVID-19 and climate change challenges on farming. Now, head of business for Olam Coco Ghana, Eric Botre, told Joy Business that the company will continue to offer support to farmers and Cocoa Board to ensure that the country meets its production target. He spoke to Joy Business at this year's annual Cocoa Managers Conference. Uh, in areas where we needed to go down to allow the industry to succeed, we did. So those were times that Cocoa Board was not able to pay for uh, 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 the, 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 far, uh, the farm gate prices. Uh, what happened was a lot of companies exited the industry and the market. Olam continued to be present uh, and then we took on some of these losses. Uh, and, uh, but we used as an opportunity uh, to, to make a statement that uh, Olam is not here only to uh, milk the farmer. Uh, Olam is not here to milk the economy. Olam is here to provide partnership and to be able to grow, to provide the necessary partnership to government uh, so that all of us can succeed. Uh, we are operating a lot of businesses, as you know, especially Take Coco. Uh, we have a lot of processing plants uh, uh, across the world. Uh, and if you look at it, almost 60 65 percent of the world cocoa is between Ghana and Ivory Coast. And therefore, we need to really show love to our cocoa farmer, uh, for the cocoa farmer to continuously have the confidence and the will to go to the cocoa farm the next morning. And that is what we have done. Really uh, uh, expanded. If you, if you look at today's, uh, uh, you feel like the session, all the 500 to 600 managers that are here, almost about 100 of them are newly recruited managers of various fields coming from the four or five universities of Ghana. Uh, and it is, it is a testimony to the fact that in the midst of the pandemic, you can still succeed. Uh, we think that this year, 21-22 uh, uh, financial year will be better. If you look at it, Cocoa Board has syndicated $1.5 billion instead of the 1.3. So we are not contracting as an economy, we are rather expanding. Uh, and that is uh, enough testimony for us that our projected number of uh, 200,000 tons uh, minimum uh, definitely will be done. Now, strong leadership and team dynamics are very important for businesses if they are to recover swiftly from the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on their operations. But how do you build teamwork, enhance communication, and does hybrid work bring any complications? is the question I pose to Nixon Amoyua, who is Managing Director of Kevin Clay People Development. So co co communication is everything. Actually, the, the concept of team uh, is built on trust. To, to have a team, you must have a trust. The, the people within the team must trust each other, that each person will do what he or she is supposed to, and to be able to so, more or less leverage on that person achieving to do this. And one key thing that drives trust is communication. So it is very important that you leverage on the communication. And by communication, we are looking at the verbal communication, the written communication, the onset communication, which is the body language. And in, in a team, it's very important that you, you have a chat around your communication. And, and uh, we, we should also say that things are really changing uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. People are having to work from home, so we have virtual work. Uh, what kind of complications uh, does this bring to, I mean, the team building effort? Because and does it always have to do with being together? I mean, seeing that people have to work remotely now, how do we forge a strong team whilst working remotely and not being together, does it really matter? So it, it has got an impact. I think you, you've touched on the, um, the, the impact of the COVID. Because of COVID, now most businesses are doing what we call the hybrid work. Mm. The hybrid work is where you have some people working from the office and some people working from a remote location. I normally refrain from using home because there are some people who are working from other locations aside home and not their office. And that creates its own complications because there, there, there are three models. I have done a study across Ghana, and there are three models that are being practiced. Mm. There, there is a model where you have got a set of employees because of what they do are required to be in the office. And there is a set of employees who, by the work they do, are allowed to work from home. So there's a group in the office, there's a group at home. 
There's a second model where um, everybody is made to come to work um, some part of the week or in a week and take the following week off or work from another location. And it, it cuts across the whole business. Everybody does it. And there's a hybrid between the two where you have got some portion of some part of the workforce being on site, working in the office, and some coming in some part of the week and taking, working from remote locations some part of the week. And where you have a hybrid workforce, what normally happens, especially when you have the, the option one, the first one that I mentioned, you, you tend to have two cultures developing. Uh, because you have people who are working on site, they see each other every day, they communicate with uh, each other, looking in the eyes. And then you have a second set of people who are working from remote location, and they don't see each other every day, and you are struggling to bring them together. When people are working together, bringing them together is a little easy. However, when they are apart, if you are not careful, what happens is that they drift away from what the organization is supposed to achieve and what they, as a group they are supposed to achieve. And that is when you as the leader or as an organization, you have to put in a lot more effort to ensure that you, you don't let two cultures emerge within your organization. And aside that, you, you put in extra effort to engage people who are working from remote locations having regular communication with them, having regular catch up with them, checking up on them, and making sure the accountabilities are clear. Team building, very important for business recovery amid the pandemic. That's Business Live tonight. There's more news on our website, myjoyonline.com forward slash business. You will see that story we have been reporting tonight. Moody's affirming Ghana's B ratings, a B3 ratings, keeping outlook negative. And also in the headlines, Ghana's international reserves to go up uh, 16.8 percent to 9.5 billion dollars in 2021 according to a report and that's business live tonight thanks for watching my name is daryl kwa we'll be back same time tomorrow